I'm Jordan, and I'm here to talk about drunk driving. Every 15 minutes, all around the U.S., a person is killed by a drunk driver. My family happens to be the culprit of this tragic event, just six years ago, actually. My cousin Alyssa was hit and killed by a drunk driver. The man fled the scene, and only to be later found hiding in the police. Police took him in on a suspicion of felony drunk driving and vehicle manslaughter. However, he was later released from jail because he had to either be charged with a crime or let go. It took two long years to sentence the man that killed my cousin. By the time he was done, he was tried with the account of manslaughter and only received two years in prison. This is not his first time of offense, however. He had already had two DUIs on record. You may ask, what does that, this have to do with your speech? Well, my main claim is that the greater, that greater penalties will, will reduce drunk driving deaths. My first point to support this claim is that high rates of drunk driving prove that current laws are inadequate. According to MAD, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, which is an, actually an organization that has parents, grandparents, family, friends that have lost a loved one to drunk driving. They estimate that 32% of fatal car crashes involve an intoxicated driver. According to NA, NCADD, which is the National Council of Alcoholism and Drug Dependence, says that just over 1.4 million people are arrested for drunk driving and 78,000 people are convicted. In 2011, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration says that 15% of all those drivers involved a fatal car crash during the week, which compared to 31% during the weekends. Now on to my second point, which is the cost of stricter enforcement is less than the continued cost of drunk driving consequences. The NACDD reveals that alcohol-related crashes cost American taxpayers over $100 billion. The annual cost of alcohol-related car crashes will decrease um, by actually a lot if we um, if we can you know have more enforcement and things like that. Which, due to public awareness and prevention and also enforcement deaths have decreased by 48.5%. From 1982, which had 26,172, to 2006, which had 13,470. My final point is that enforcement against previous offenders would reduce this problem. My mo Mothers Against Dri Drunk Driving, or MAD, claims that two-thirds of these sentenced to incarnation are repeated offenders. So most people get the DUI and drink and drive again. Statistics show that 30% of drivers have a BAC of 0 0.8 or higher. So that's a lot. Um, 50 to 70% of con convicted drunk drivers continue to drive on the suspended license, says the NCADD. In conclusion, the high rates of drunk driving proves that current laws are inadequate. The cost of stricter enforcement is less than the cost of drunk driving accidents and the consequences. And lastly, enforcement against previous offenders would substantially reduce this problem. These three points help to prove that greater penalties would reduce drunk driving and the deaths. Having had someone in my family killed by by this is such a huge impact on me and how I see things. There's many ways to prevent this tragic event. If we all work together to prevent this, we won't lose as many people. So take an Uber next time you go out with friends or call a friend to take you and pick you up from a party or a family gathering. Um, you can even prevent, you know, by being the person, be the, be the DD for the night. You know, have, let your friends have fun. Take the time and think about other safety around you. Um, I always will talk about this to and tell my cousin's story because it's really important in our society today. Um, other victims in, um, should also be told about their stories. And you can also go on if you want more information on um, 
Mothers Against Drunk Driving website. They have a lot of information. We can prevent this from happening. Thank you. All right, a lot of nice things in the speech and a couple of things that need uh, a little bit more work. Um, the proposition is very clearly stated. I thought it was well organized internally. You've got secondary claims that are declarative sentences, so it's easy to follow the reasoning processes that you're going into. There's a lot of data uh, on each of the points. There's a huge amount of statistical data on the second point, uh, for instance. So I, I don't think that there's a lot of doubt that there is a problem here. The one place where I think that you need some additional information is the argument that some, something can be done, that the things that could be done would make a difference. Um, you know, encouraging people to do Uber and stuff like that, that's an individual kind of thing. But your claim is that the penalties need to be greater. There needs to be something more substantive there. So is there a place where they have stronger penalties than we have? Is there a place that has been able to reduce drunk driving? What are some of the examples of penalties that things that you would be talking about? I'm not necessarily saying you, you have to advocate those particular points, don't turn it into a policy argument, but if you can say in Finland they confiscate your car if you are convicted of drunk driving and it's awfully hard for you to drive when you have no car, that would be a good illustration of the point that this would be effective. Um, if, if uh, you know, in El Salvador, you get executed for uh, a second drunk driving offense, well, that would show pretty much that people are less likely to, you know, commit those kinds of offenses. I, I just think we need some data on that part of the argument because, you know, the, the recognition is you had one statistic there that I think strongly suggests that the penalties that, the idea that penalties are going to work is problematic. It's like, Two-thirds, I forget what the number was, of yeah. people who are, who are convicted of drunk driving are driving on suspended licenses, which seems to suggest that the issue is that you know, punishment doesn't seem to affect them. Now, you're, the inference I think you're making is that the punishment isn't enough, and I think the argument that the respondent might very well make is that punishment doesn't enter into their minds. They aren't thinking about those kinds of things because... They have alcohol problems, you know, and so if they're an alcoholic or they uh, don't understand or they just have bad judgment, they're not thinking about what the punishment's going to be. They just have bad judgment in that situation. So how is a punishment, how is a potential punishment going to make an impact? And that's why yeah, I think you need to have some of that other information in the argument. You did a nice job citing all of your sources uh, for the most part. I thought that was pretty effective. Uh, the personal story is fine. I don't want to... I already sound like a crotchety old man for the day, you know, so I apologize about that, and this is not a big deal. In the opening phrase, your family was the culprit of this? No, they were the victims of this. The culprit was the guy who hid in the bushes or wherever he hid, and you know, then didn't get convicted for two years, and then only got sentenced to jail for two years. He's the culprit, not your family. Your family are the victims in that situation. So you just gotta be careful about the terminology, because it bugs in that situation. All right, thank you. Thank you.